uh, Giri, we can start now, Giri. We are live. Good afternoon, friends. Welcome you all to this distinguished lecture series on energy efficiency. As you all know, we have uh, uh, this distinguished lecture series on the first Monday of every month. This is the 11th lecture in, uh, in this series. The objective is to bring you thought leaders uh, from India and abroad to share with you their thoughts so that the overall capacity of, uh, of uh, the Indian industry and engineers uh, become better in terms of uh, overall energy efficiency concepts and uh, newer developments. We are privileged to have <clears throat> today Dr. Rene Van Berkel, uh, uh, Head of uh, Regional Office in India of United Nations Industrial Development Organization. Welcome, Rene. It's our uh, pleasure and privilege to have you uh, speaking to us at this, uh, this program. Uh, he heads the Regional Office of UNIDO in India. And as we all know, UNIDO works to foster inclusive and sustainable industrialization in its member developing countries. Dr. Rene has got more than 32 years of professional experience in industrial resource and energy efficiency, cleanup production, productivity, innovation. He also worked extensively in areas of social responsibility and circular economy. Dr. Rene is an alumni of uh, University of Amsterdam and Wageningen University. <clears throat> Uh, Dr. Rene has, uh, uh, I have had the privilege of uh, knowing uh, Rene for more than uh, 15 years. Since 1993, he has been instrumental in fostering adoption of cleaner production and industrial ecology in developing and emerging uh, countries in both Asia and Eastern Europe. One unique thing about Dr. Rene is that he has worked at the interface of academia, government and industry uh, with uh, equal uh, knowledge and felicity in each of these areas. He has served in applied research and academic roles in the Netherlands and us and Australia between 1989 to 2008. He served as UNIDO's program lead on resource efficiency and cleaner production at Vienna. Under his guidance, uh, uh, the RECP became a, a major concept, which have become extremely popular, and uh, uh, resource efficiency and cleaner production centers are in operation in nearly 50 emerging and developing economies. Last few years, Dr. Rene has been leading and guiding UNIDO's activities in India and, and South Asia. Thank you, Rene. Thank you for your uh, time and uh, presence here. And apart from all that, Dr. Rene is a, a definitely a thought leader and is extremely articulate uh, in presenting uh, newer concepts. Over to you, Rene. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Kiei, and uh, uh, thank you uh, to uh, CII for inviting me. Uh, let me see what I can share the content. I, uh, I actually, um, I think you can see it, eh? is it fine? So now it's there. So I will speak about uh, energy efficiency, even though I have a, 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 a little bit of an issue. I am neither an energy engineer nor an energy economist. So I, I'm a bit of a jack of all trades talking about productivity and innovation in a broader sense. But of course, this is very uh, relevant to uh, energy efficiency. And so I will speak uh, about the uh, industrial energy efficiency. And I think some of the lessons might also be applicable to kind of buildings and transport sector. But uh, the main focus is really on the industrial manufacturing sector. Uh, so as Gary mentioned, uh, I, I represent UNIDO, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. And just for those who are less familiar with, with uh, UNIDO, uh, our mandate is to uh, uh, promote a, a, a industrial development in the, the, our uh, member states, and particularly then around SDG 9, which is uh, building resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization and foster innovation. So the link between indus industry and innovation is very strong. And this inclusive and sustainable industrial development is basically along the tripartite goals of advancing economic competitiveness, safeguarding the environment and creating shared prosperity, which in uh, many regards are uh, a mouthful, uh, quite abstract concepts. Uh, so I like to say that it, we basically need to look at industrialization that works for, for markets so that we have products and services that are sought after in the market and uh, have good quality and that work for people. So we have decent conditions of work. We keep people and communities safe and that also work for the environment and climate, which is then the uh, subset that I will be uh, dealing with uh, this afternoon. Uh, so uh, in that, of course, uh, uh, energy is a key component. And I take a, a little bit of step back. I know this is now all, um, a little bit older, but Unido started his works basically on the industrial energy efficiency with the Industrial Development Report in 2011, which was uh, uh, pre the uh, uh, pre Paris, pre uh, SDGs, and so on. But what we what was basically in there, as if I just take a few graphs, that we it was observed that industrial energy efficiency is dropping, and you see here that it's dropping 
dropping uh, over time. So this is uh, basically your tons of oil equivalent, but thousand uh, dollars of uh, manufacturing value. But you see it coming down in all income groups, but it, it's still by far the highest in the lower income and developing countries. So it came down uh, the uh, energy intensity, but it's uh, in the developing countries still much higher than in the uh, developed economies. And if we do a, a composite analysis of this, uh, how, what, it, what drives this improvement in industrial energy efficiency, then there the, are the basically two components. One is the structural change. So uh, country, countries are changing the, the, the composition of manufacturing. So it's more going towards higher value at manufacturing and lighter industry. And that results in overall manufacturing in energy intensity coming down. Uh, and that is actually the bigger part of it is 12.5% and then the technology Logical improvements was 9.8 percent. Even though these data are now 10 years old, I don't think the picture has uh, changed drastically. Of course, the numbers have, but the overall picture is clear there that investing in energy efficient technology systems and process can provide environmental, economic and social dividends and is in that sense uh, uh, necessary for the green growth and for low carbon industrialization. Uh, what was also found there was that uh, if you look at uh, two, three uh, uh, decennia, then the industrial energy intensity uh, in these graphs, which you see here, it comes down by on average 1.7 percent per year uh, on the long term average. Of course, there's, there's some peaks and troughs in there, but that seems to be there. And the, the, the really the potential is quite clearly there to double this to 3.4 percent per year. And that is also the part of the, the, uh, the SDG commitments to, to look at this. But the worrying fig figure is actually that uh, concern is actually that the International Energy Agency is reporting now, 2018, 2019, that this rate of improving energy efficiency is actually slowing down. So we need to find ways to, to, to reinvigorate and to accelerate progress on energy efficiency. Uh, so I, I want to do uh, basically two components in my uh, my presentation here. First, I want to look a little bit at what I see happening now and comment on that, and maybe also share some Unido experiences. And then in the second part of the talk, I would rather go and then uh, elaborate a little bit on more of what I see as horizons where maybe energy efficiency can be done with uh, with a broader perspective of looking at resources and synergies. So uh, the low carbon demand side uh, strategy which UNIDO has is I'm basically looking for sustainable energy and energy security uh, for in particular in the energy intensive uh, sectors and clusters. And we see that as a three pronged strategy essentially. So we see energy efficiency that is our concern as improving the efficiency of energy use in industry. So basically that's around your specific energy consumption. But that needs to be uh, in tandem with improving the resource productivity or basically bringing down your specific water consumption, your specific materials consumption. So if we use less stuff, we will also use less energy. And that drives then the transformation to energy efficiency and low carbon development. And of course, uh, we need to bring this in sync with uh, decarbonizing our energy supply, which is then maximizing the use of all appropriate renewable uh, energy sources. And with renewables, I, I tend to include and also looking at waste heat that might be available. So renewables in a broader sense. And this, of course, we see in increasingly, this needs to be informed by uh, improved energy management and energy planning. Uh, and where appropriate, maybe also look then at the, uh, the energy storage uh, as part of the, uh, the, the solution to low carbon industry. So, as I said before, I want to look at, 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 at what I see happening uh, is, is basically that we have three buckets of energy efficiency, which are happening at, uh, simultaneously uh, and maybe consecutively in, in the specific units, but they are more or less happening in parallel. Uh, the, one, the first one is, is what I would refer to as kind of the improved, uh, or I can also say a fix up. So, it's basically addressing all the issues that, that are kind of immediate uh, energy losses, which can be remedified quite easily with low, low capital investments. I put there as an indicative figure, definitely not more than 10 lakhs, and in many cases much lower. Then I think there is a bucket of opportunities which are around the upgrade. So that there is a lot of 
energy efficient technologies available which are by and large confirmed or are proven feasible, maybe not necessarily next door, but in a broader context considered feasible, and that require investment, but these are investments which are which are uh, profitable or which is a, in, in reason could be uh, afforded by it. So I would call that like the upgrades or the improvements which are there. And then the third bucket is the kind of the innovations where uh, there is a change of the basic technology or the processes where higher capital investments are required and where of course you would also have higher risk but potentially also higher rewards in terms of deeper cuts of emissions deeper cuts or deeper savings of energy so if i look at some of the this what specifically can be done in these areas then i think in the improving uh, strategy you you see basically a good returns without significant investment and there's and, and we can talk about it and this talk has been the same for the last 25 or 30 years but it's just not being practiced enough and we we should we sound like a broken record but we still have to do this good housekeeping know your energy use switch off what's not productive fix what needs fixing so if there's if there's a, a, a one person once said to me in the old days it, if you had a steam leak that was a good sign but because it meant that the boiler was operating and we need to still get these perceptions around that that this is a sign of that money is basically basically being lost we still see compressed air being used to cool people and this is not efficient and this is a perception we see uh, it's common accepted that we go in the street we see energy efficient street lighting but it's switched on in the daytime so we still don't have this mindset right that we energy needs to have a productive uh, uh, application in that. So good housekeeping is there. Then the simple equipment modifications are there. Certainly, I think in traditional areas are insulation, heat recovery, uh, which are really very well proven and also also very cost efficient and not not expensive. And the better process controls, I think, it fits also in this category where you say you optimize the set points. You look at your fuel air ratio. You look at your compressed air pressure. Whether that's the right one, can that be moderated or uh, modulated? How can we, we improve with the, the systems which we have? And I think the basic point is that we need to overcome the knowledge gaps and the attitude barriers that energy basically matters for bottom line performance. I think the larger industries has basically come onto this, but many small and medium sized enterprises do not yet make the connection between energy use and profitability profits in the end. So uh, just to, to share then uh, one of the examples of what we're doing, uh, that's the Jeff 4 project, which uh, we do with Bureau of Energy Efficiency or Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy in selected MSME sectors. So we've uh, over the past years have supported 12 clusters in five sectors. I won't list them all, but dairy foundry, ceramics, brass and hand tools. And we've, what we've done is uh, we set up energy monitoring centers, or I would rather have said monitoring cells. So provide the associations with some monitoring kits so that you can actually go out and find out where the energy is being used, where energy is lost. Uh, those uh, uh, cluster uh, centers have uh, uh, supported uh, 345 MSMEs and they implemented then over 600 me energy measures. They saved 10,000 or nearly 11,000 thousand tons of uh, oil equivalent and uh, 63,000 tons of DHG. And that's an investment of 90 crore associated with this with annual savings of 59 crores, which means roughly uh, 18 months payback if you take the, the bold average. There might be some which are better and certainly also some which are worse. But this is this is not a lot of money if you look at this as, as, as 350 MS, MSMEs going in there. And right now we are with, also with the support of the Green Business Center scaling this up to a further 11 clusters in three sectors. Uh, for which we have then uh, identified these replicable technologies, basically, and then trying to to uh, assist the enterprise to basically make an implementation plan. So we've already taken out the guesswork of what what are feasible measures. We just want to to get your implementation roadmap there, and for that we have over 1,100 MSME expressions of interest. Uh, so if I just take a few examples so of the dairy sector, so if you take a mool, uh, they say 50 lakhs annually by repairing just the compressed air leaks and virtually no cost, labor cost only. Uh, invested 3.2 lakhs for condensate recovery, save 7.2 lakhs, which is then basically a payback of four months. Uh, Gopal Dairy, they installed then a soft starters for the refrigeration unit, uh, 2.9 lakhs investment to save that 4.8 lakhs, so it's also just seven months. 
uh, Dutzaga Dairy uh, installed an available free, uh, frequency drive on ghee processing, uh, uh, 82,000 uh, investment savings, 1.3 lakhs, so that's about seven, eight months. And Sumo Dairy then a plate heat exchanger for yo yogurt units, uh, 4.2 lakhs savings, 8.6 lakhs, so that's six months. So we see that even in, in organized sectors, there are still many opportunities if we bring in this perspective of energy as a cost and energy can drive your productivity. I want to take the opportunity, uh, oh, sorry, and then right now what's happened, work that's happening is that we're putting these technology compendiums uh, together, it's too small on the screen, but you might take a, take a, a inspiration of that, which is basically like 15, 20 key measures that can be taken in specific clusters. Uh, what is the kind of typical investment rate, what's the typical uh, savings, and that can be promoted. I want to take the opportunity to also high, uh, link then to work that UNIDO is doing globally on the uh, industrial energy accelerator, as it's called, uh, which captures basically global best practices in industrial energy efficiency. And this takes a, a perspective on, uh, on one hand on the energy management systems, basically 50,001 ISO, and then also looking at the uh, uh, systems optimization, uh, what is happening. Uh, and systems optimi optimization is really saying that we should not just optimize the boiler, but we should look at the boiler along with the steam requirements, the steam traps, and all the controls which are there. So this focuses basically on motor-driven systems, industrial heating systems, and industrial cooling systems. If you just take from UNIDA's work uh, on the energy management systems, which is basically has been a focus for 12 years, but this was after 10 years, you see the different countries where this was supported. And we come time and time again with, let me highlight this figure, four to 15 percent energy savings in companies uh, in the first year of uh, implementation of an energy management system with little or no capital investment. So this is my, my, uh, my thing of uh, improve or fix up in the first place. And then in terms of the system optimization, there are these uh, booklets now available, which in this case I've just put on the motor system optimization. So it guides you through a set of questions to really analyze the performance of key components of the motor system and then optimize this. And then here also you see then that this has been rolled out in 18 countries and you see the number of enterprises which have been taking this on. So these are all systems which are uh, online and available. I would really encourage people though to, to just glance through this and take this as a source of inspiration to, to move forward. Then I get to my second category, the middle basket, which is basically upgrades using efficient uh, equipment and devices that typically have a higher investment cost, but have a, have a good payback. And the, you think that a replacement of energy equipment is, is one of the key ones, boilers, compressors, furnaces, uh, automation of energy and process controls with energy and its VFBs or with uh, PLCs for industrial automation, and some modifications of process equipment, but that's very specific. And then I think the, here, the, the, here the key point is to, the, to reduce the perceived investment risk and making appropriate financing available. We see that many of the MSMEs are getting access or are being exposed to these technologies, but not getting the level of confidence to invest because it's just reliant on a vendor coming pa passing by and saying this is the best way for you to go. And tomorrow somebody else comes and tells them tells a different story. So we need a more authoritative, quote unquote, and impartial advice that this is the way to go for certain sectors. And with that, we take out a little bit of the guesswork and that improves the profitability, of course, of this. Uh, so here we have a, a project together with ESL and Ministry of MSME um, uh, in promoting market transformation for energy efficiency and MSME clusters. And it basically works on a three-stage uh, uh, approach with this market transformation. First, to standardize the technology, so to come up with replicable solutions of what can be done in a cluster like uh, Muzaffarnagar paper cluster, what are typical solutions, then looking at aggregation, so can we build procure and get a price reduction, and then looking at innovative financing through ESL as uh, 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 ESCO contracts. Uh, so that's in 10 clusters which are around here, I will not go through that. So far we've just done 20 replicable energy efficient technologies uh, and this is being trialed in 10 MSME clusters. So just to take uh, a few examples of what has been, where the monitoring and verification has been done in Surat, 
uh, so on the left hand side you see then the replacement of energy efficient with uh, installation of energy efficient screw compressors rather than reciprocating compressors so the target uh, for the specific energy cons uh, consumption is a reduction by 40 percent and you see in the demo units that a little bit dependent on the load pattern this can be achieved but the, the one that the investment is 6.7 lakh and then saving 3.8, so that's less than half a year, uh, 50,000 kilowatt hours energy saving. And the second one is a larger unit, 16 lakh invested, annual savings 14 lakh. So that's about, uh, what is it, 10, 11 months, uh, 190 kilowatt, thousand kilowatt hours saved. The second example I want to give is on the PLC control on jet dyeing machines. And there, uh, the, uh, of course, our specific energy tar consumption target is 10%, but we see there are uh, many other uh, benefits being achieved by optimizing the jet dyeing, in particular water requirement, batch time, liquor ratio, and chemical requirements. So if you look at this just from the perspective of energy, then the demo one at 16 lakh investment, 14.2 lakh savings, uh, 345 ton coal equivalent per year. Uh, so that's within a year. The other one was 18 lakh savings was higher. Uh, uh, annual savings was lower, sorry, 17.9, but that means still a payback of two years. The differences in the uh, payback are largely a reflection of how well the jet dyeing process was managed before the automation. So if the companies did quite well before, their savings are lesser than the ones which had lim more limited control. Um, then I get to the innovate uh, category, so change to new process and new technologies. And that's the, the biggest issue is the, basically the uncertainty on the uh, uh, process, on the performance of unproven technology. And we can see that we, it's highly specific, but we can look at new processes. So a lot of emphasis now on the additive manufacturing rather than deductive. This, this removed material, so added physical instead of chemical, new technologies, new products. And the, really the issue is that we need to support the, the set of the innovation system. So we support identification, deployment and commercialization of what is con may, may be more conceivable rather than proven technologies. Here we've done work on the global clean tech innovation program, which was basically an accelerator program that supported uh, market trans trans innovators to transform into uh, startup companies. Uh, there were 26 startups uh, that succeeded. They had a Jeff grant of $1 million that uh, was increased or matched by $7 million of investment at the end of the process. A project, sorry, two years later on that has increased to 20, 21 million US dollars. So quite innovative. Some of the examples then here is Atomberg from, uh, um, uh, Mo from Mumbai, I think, if I'm not mistaken. So they put basically a BLDC motor into a, a, a ceiling fan and they bring down the energy consumption by at least 60% from typically 70 watts to 28 or even less watts for a ceiling fan. Uh, the other example, which is uh, quite interesting, is this uh, um, Angi Sumuk. The name pronunciation is a, a challenge, but basically they engineered what he calls a horizontal flame for uh, cooking appliances, and that achieves 30% plus fuel savings in cooking and commercial kitchens, but it can also be applied in, uh, in, in uh, larger commercial furnaces. Taking this forward, we, we basically also uh, take this uh, towards the the, the perception that we, we need in this innovation ecosystem to have both the, the product value enhanced, so that is basically getting an idea to a prototype and that proving that is valuable to the customer, and also create business value for the investor. So setting it up in an, in an innovator, in a startup company that, that is worth investing in. And that is more the work that we do with the Facility for Low Carbon Technology Deployment, FLCTD, that we run with uh, uh, Bureau of Energy Efficiency and uh, uh, um, the, the Green Business Center is also an execution partner. So we offer their deployment support. So we have a technology challenge to identify early stage innovations with significant energy and GHD emission reduction potential we have had traditionally three uh, uh, pillars, waste heat recovery pumps and pumping systems and space conditioning. And you see that over the last three years, we have selected uh, 40 uh, startup early innovators to support. And then bring the innovator and industry partner together uh, for field trials with partial funding to basically demonstrate the innovation, but also validate the efficacy and determine the scale up opportunities. Last year, we, uh, we introduced three new te te technology verticals, industrial uh, Internet of Things, resource efficiency, and electric energy storage, but there's not yet uh, uh, any uh, movement forward there. 
I think my system is speeding up. So this is one of the examples, the uh, slip start, the, um, start synchronous run motor, which basically combines a hybrid motor for pumping, and that gives you a better operation for, uh, efficiency and less uh, start motor starting currents. And it gives overall 30% energy efficiency improvement and smaller pump size. So if you assume 10% uh, pump replacement in the uh, in, uh, irrigation pumping, this would uh, save 12,000 gigawatt hours of electricity use annually. So if we, these small things can uh, ultimately make uh, an, a national level a significant uh, uh, way forward. A uh, second example is waste heat recovery from bulk mill chilling. So we basically capture the waste heat from bulk mill chillers to generate then hot water, which can be used in cleaning in place and improve then also the hygiene. Uh, so uh, with a typical system, you can then generate 500 liters hot water, which is enough to clean the equipment. And with 20% market penetration, that would save up to four, close to 40,000 megawatt hours electricity annually. This is done by Prometheum Energy. Uh, then, uh, plus uh, technologies is, is introduced in this thermal energy storage for chest coolers. So they basically put pouches with phase change material in the inside of a chest cooler or chest freezer, and that acts then as a uh, as a to improve energy uh, temperature retention and reduce operation of the compressor and also cover up for periods that we have a power interruption. So with a chest cooler, they can be maintained three and a half hours without power and that save 115 kilowatt hours per year. A chest freezer, it can even operate 16 hours without power uh, and save then 27, 27 kilowatt hours a year on a, on a standard size uh, uh, chest freezer. So this equipment is very useful in the, in the retail and other places where maybe your, uh, um, your uh, the power availability is not so great. So we can also extend that with uh, the thermal energy storage batteries for cold chain, which is done by Tesol. So you basically make these uh, uh, phase change materials, these uh, batteries, which you put in a, in, a, in a truck, delivery truck, and then you maintain cold storage for eight to uh, 10 hours. And that saves then uh, uh, diesel uh, into the refrigeration truck. And at 20% markets, so this would avoid close to 9,500 kiloliters of diesel annually in India. This is Tesol doing this. Uh, I think that this is uh, basically my, my uh, reflection on, uh, on what we should do. We should uh, accelerate uh, each of the areas of uh, basically uh, fixing up, then in improving, and then ultimately innovating. But I think that what I would also like to, to emphasize in the next 10 minutes or so is, is to, to focus on this, uh, the opportunities for taking a wider perspective on energy as just one of the resource inputs to industry, and that opens then additional avenues for energy efficiency. And I will then highlight that from the perspective of industrial resource efficiency, which is basically uh, saving energy by conserving materials and water or using better chemicals, industrial symbiosis, so that's energy, saving energy through multi-firm networks or process innovation to look really for new innovative technologies. So I will share a few slides on this and some examples, maybe international examples, more as a source of inspiration uh, that we, we need to, to think outside of the box of what we have as our energy efficiency toolbox. Uh, so on industrial resource efficiency, as I put here the graph from the water development report, it basically shows that most industries are, 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 have a match between uh, both being water intensive and energy intensive. Uh, the only outlier is the aviation industry where energy intensity is much higher than, than, fuel, than, the, uh, war, than the water intensity. So the many industries are good opportunities for water savings. And that is the basic concept of uh, uh, resource efficiency and cleaner production, which you see in this diagram. We, we maximize the efficiency, the productivity of water, energy materials, and basically we have less time to throw away into the environment so we have less waste, less emissions, less effluents, and that improves then the uh, factory environment, we improve well-being, which adds to resource efficiency. So this resource efficiency and clean production then deals with the materials, the uh, energy, water, waste, uh, uh, emissions, and uh, effluents. And we have this global network that Deary was referring to in the introduction. So just as, as a simple example of some recent work that is with Campo, where we introduced some cleaner leather technologies. So we, we uh, uh, do this alternative unhairing process. We can uh, basically reduce the salinity and effluent load by 30% through uh, this uh, hair recovery process. And this then saves a lot of energy in the, actually in the wastewater treatment and in the water handling. 
uh, then with uh, water conservation can be and, and energy and chemicals conservation can be achieved by basically measurement and visual and use reuse of water and then here we did also a little bit of solar air drying for the leather sector this is materials which have then also been promoted to uh, a kind of a standard guidance on uh, sustainable leather manufacturing which is being uh, adopted by uh, the uh, uh, leather panel which is an agglomeration of international leather companies and buyers uh, so then I take uh, it to the industrial symbiosis, so where we, or you might say into industrial parks, where we, we look at uh, using waste from one company into another company, and that's the typical kind of eco-industrial parks, where we combine the resource efficiency in cleaner production at enterprise level with integration of energy and water systems and symbiotic exchanges, so where the waste from one company becomes an input to another company. And there's been quite extensive work done, also CII has been involved in some of this work to develop an international reference guides, which are listed here on eco-industrial parks and also some practical tools in there. So just to give some international examples of what is achievable, and I take this uh, one from Quinana, where I was involved myself and I worked in Australia, uh, which is a large um, resource intensive pro uh, industrial area near Perth in Australia. One of the things is their cogeneration plant, which basically takes the refinery fuel gas from the, re the oil refinery and use that as auxiliary fuel for the steam turbine, and then basically provides then also steam to uh, the refinery. With this flexibility of steam and power supply, Supply, the efficiency of the uh, oil refinery is improved. They claim at times six to eight percent efficiency improvement in the refining, which is a huge uh, benefit there. And this is integrated in the state power grid as uh, fuel efficiency. And then they, they, you have also the Queen, Queen Island Water Reclamation Plant, which basically takes the treated sewer, sewerage and then puts that through uh, ultrafiltration and microfiltration to pr pr produce uh, low TDS water, which is not drinking water, but is a high pure water for industrial applications. And then because of the low TDS, you have less scaling problems in, and you actually improve the energy efficiency in all the boilers which are operating in the industrial park. Then uh, another example I take from Ulsan in Korea, where they actually uh, went as far of uh, what they no locally refer as a, as a steam highway, which connects demand and, and supply of steam uh, between different uh, enterprises. So there's an oil refinery, chemical plant, and uh, a power station, and uh, a, a few uh, uh, waste incinerators connected. And this uh, steam highway achieves now annual savings of 19.2 million US dollars and uh, CO2 savings of uh, 45 point, 48 sorry, 0.5 kilotons of CO2. So uh, it was where the traditional view is that you can't transport steam over longer distances or more than a few meters. This is actually being uh, constructed as a pipeline of uh, uh, almost 15 kilometers and is providing multiple benefits, energy efficiency, but also or increased uh, operational eff efficiency in the different plants. Then I think in, the, in terms of the innovation, I would like to, to uh, highlight this, which came up basically out of the energy efficiency work in, in, uh, in, uh, in Denmark, which is, uh, is some refer to as the onion model, which is saying that basically we need to look at the energy service of why do we need energy, what is then the way of delivering the energy service or the process, then look at the type of equipment and the efficiency, then the controls, the operation and maintenance and good housekeeping. And what is the big challenge I, I, we observe is that uh, with the energy efficiency measures, we, we don't drill sufficiently down into the process and the energy service. But we, we are dealing with the, the outer layers of the onion model, because that is where the replicab replicability is for the energy equipment and the controls and so on. But the core process and the core energy services are maybe not enough uh, addressed. And we see now more emphasis in, uh, in Europe and maybe Japan, Australia, on trying to get to the level of uh, what is the energy service needed in the process and how can we innovate on that. And I think a, a particular uh, strong uh, example for this of, of different frameworks which are there is basically green chemistry and green engineering, uh, which, are, which are not different from traditional chemistry and you know, traditional engineering. The laws of thermodynamics still apply, but it's trying to apply this with a view of achieving different environment and sustainability outcomes. And that is then often reflected in this green chemistry principles where design for energy efficiency is in there, but also using safer solvents, design for degradation, catalysis in there. So I, I personally believe that, uh, that India can uh, still uh, capture an, an opportunity 
opportunity, uh, given that the chemical and or chemical synthesis is such a huge sector in India, uh, to actually embrace this green chemistry and engineering. Uh, we saw on the GSEP, the Global Clean Tech Program, uh, some examples. I, I will just put that there, basically around uh, supercritical fluid extractions of its carbon dioxide uh, to for Domba uh, Aspartica for uh, different uh, cloves, uh, cumin, and so on, and also using that for um, the uh, uh, silk, silk warm pulp, pulp wave, so it, what is left over after you extract, extract the, the silk, uh, you can extract their uh, omega-3, which is added as a feed uh, supplement. And then uh, the other ones would be Cellzyme Biotech, which is engineered enzymes for antibiotic synthesis at room temperature and without uh, uh, solvents. And the solvents uh, uh, are really uh, an energy consumer because we have to uh, create a vacuum to evaporate the, the solvents for the solvent recovery. So if we can do this uh, synthesis at uh, room temperature, we have uh, many uh, uh, energy benefits. Uh, I, I, maybe I'll uh, illustrate that this, is, of course, is then also has its applications in the different uh, sectors that use chemicals. Uh, so, particularly in the uh, like textile industry, we see now this uh, whole issue of going to waterless uh, textile dyeing, and then you see uh, solution dyes for nylon, uh, which reduce water consumption by 80%. So, you basically uh, uh, put the, the, the dye in the extrusion of the polymer of the nylon, and you have fewer chemicals and CO2 emissions, lower energy consumption, and it's longer lasting as the color, uh, as the fabric uh, fades uh, less. And uh, the other example, I take a bit of pride because this is uh, actually a Dutch company doing this now on a larger scale is this supercritical carbon dioxide dyeing, where you basically use supercritical carbon dioxide for text for polyester dyeing and other materials. And you have zero water, zero wastewater. You don't need any process uh, chemicals like levelers and salts, and you have 98% of the dye uptake. Uh, you can do this. Uh, uh, you can do this then also much smaller floor space, 40% faster, and you save 63% uh, energy. Uh, so this uh, this was initially very much frowned upon by the industry, but now there are uh, at least a dozen uh, factories operating with this technology, and it's also being uh, promoted uh, as a, an alternative for going to circular fashion. Uh, I come to uh, 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 a, a kind of a wrap up. So I, I think that uh, if I captured my my uh, last uh, 25, 30 minutes, I think that we need to accelerate and scale up the implementation of the known solutions, and that is by uh, the improvement solutions. It's really about knowledge and uh, and 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 overcoming the barriers to uh, uh, in attitude and upgrade. Is really looking more at how can we unlever and un uh, de-risk the investment decisions and innovators setting up the innovation system. And then on the other side, we need to also look at uh, more uh, looking at conceivable solutions. So I'm, I'm using the term conceivable because I want to get away from just thinking about what is immediately feasible. If we don't ne never think about what is maybe conceivable, what we could think that we could trial and er this trial and error do, then we have much more opportunities in this resource efficiency, symbiosis, and process innovation. And of course, this uh, we need to across this and address barriers in terms of attitude, skills, policy, and financing. Uh, so with that, I probably uh, keep it there. There's a number of websites here, which we can also share later on, where some of the information is there on resource efficiency, the industrial energy uh, accelerator, the low carbon innovation, the green chemistry initiative, and some of the work on the building back business from crisis. Uh, so thank you very much. I hand it back to you, Kiri and uh, Kiran. Thanks, Rene. Thank you. Uh, that 